Hello and welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and serving the over 97,000 computing professionals and students who are ACM members. I'm Nego Rostamza, the research scientist at Element AI. My, my main area of interest are computer vision and multimodal learning. I received my PhD from the University of Trento in 2017. During my PhD, I spent more than two years at Mila, Montreal Institute of Learning Algorithm, and I also work at the Multimedia and Vision Lab at the Queen Mary University of London, and in the Research and Machine Intelligence Group at Google. I'm also involved in many initiatives to increase diversity and inclusion in machine learning, deep learning, and computer vision, such as organizing the first Women in Deep Learning Workshop in 2016, co-organizing the Women in Machine Learning Workshop at NIPS 2017, and Women in Computer Vision Workshop at CVPR 2017. You can find more info about my background uh, on the bio widget on your screen. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to offer, here is more information. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bluster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in the constantly changing world of computing with a range of ACM Learning Center resources at acm.learning.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain com competitiveness in a global environment. ACM provides timely computing information published by ACM, including communications of the ACM and Q magazines, access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, international conferences that draw leading experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics, support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher uh, training, the ACM Turing and ACM Prize in Computing Awards, and the newly updated ACM Code of Ethics, a collection of principles and guidelines designed to help computing professionals make ethical, responsible decisions in professional practice. ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technologies that enriches our lives and advances our society in the digital age. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown in the slides in front of you. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you will find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you're experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows and Command R uh, if you're using a Mac, or refresh your browsers on a mobile device, or you can close and relaunch the presentation. To control volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them in the Q&A box at any time during the webinar and click the Submit button. I'll organize the questions as Ian speaks, and he'll reserve some time at the end of the presentation to address them. This session is being recorded um, and will be archived. You will receive the automatic email notification with, when it becomes available. And check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. At the end of the presentation, you will see a survey open on your screen. Please take a minute to fill out um, to help us improving our webinars. You may also open the link uh, to the survey at any time from the resources and from the resources window on your screen. You can also use the Facebook and Twitter widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends, as well as the uh, tweets, comments, and questions using the hashtag ACM Learning. We'll be watching for your tweets. We also have a new community discourse page to continue the discussion after this webcast, including questions you won't be able to get through during the Q&A questions. Uh, today's presentation is Adversarial, Adversarial Machine Learning by Ian Goodfellow. Ian Goodfellow is a staff research scientist at Google Brain, where he leads a group of researchers studying adversarial techniques in AI. He developed the first defenses against adversarial examples and was among the first to study the security and privacy of neural networks and helped to popularize the field of machine learning security and privacy. He is the lead author of the MIT Press textbook, Deep Learning. Previously, Ian has worked at OpenAI and Bulo Garage and has studied with Andrew Ng 
and Gary Brodsky at Stanford University and with Joshua Bengio and Aaron Corwell at University of Montreal. In 2017, Ian was listed among MIT Technology Reviewers 35 Innovators Under 35. Recognizing his inventions in um, inven inventions of generative adversarial networks. Ian, without further ado, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Nagar, for moderating. And thank you to the ACM for inviting me. And thank you to the audience for attending today. Um, can you see my slides OK? Uh, Nagar, are the slides getting broadcasted uh, yes. OK? Yes. Yeah, great, thank you. All right, so today I'll be telling you about the field of adversarial machine learning. The basic idea behind adversarial machine learning is that it extends machine learning from the situation where one player has one cost function representing their interests and instead deals with more than one player with more than one cost function. On the left, I show you what the cost function looks like in a traditional machine learning algorithm. We have some kind of cost function that takes a player's parameters and describes how well that player performs. Higher cost means worse performance. So this might be something like the negative log likelihood assigned to the labels on a training data set. For example, uh, what is the negative log probability that the model will assign the correct labels to all of the different images in an object recognition data set? This is the way that we train things like classifiers and many different kinds of generative models and even some kinds of reinforcement learning. On the right, I show you what happens when we start to have more than one player and more than one cost. So a player might be something like a machine learning model, or it might also be a person or a program that is trying to interfere with the operation of a machine learning model. You'll see a lot of concrete examples throughout this talk, but what we can think about easily is the example of spam detection. We have a machine learning model that wants to recognize spam, and we have spammers who want to get their spam through the system. We can model this with the language of game theory and draw a value function where we're looking for a point called a Nash equilibrium that is simultaneously a minimum of the defending player's cost and a maximum of the attacker's pl attacking player's cost. So this is, for example, a point where the spammers can't get any more of their spam through the system unless they were somehow able to change the spam detector. And the spam detector is not able to get any more accuracy unless it was somehow or other able to change the spam generation algorithms used by the spammers. Throughout my talk, I'll show you how adversarial machine learning is useful in many different machine learning research areas today. Machine learning research today is much more complicated than it was even just five years ago or so. Among people who were working in machine learning for the purpose of developing artificial intelligence, uh, there was really only one goal until about five years ago. And that goal was just to get machine learning working. There were other versions of machine learning and other applications where machine learning really did work. But those applications were usually not what we would consider AI complete. They weren't things like understanding which objects are in an image or recognizing uh, text from speech. We could attempt those tasks with machine learning, but it wasn't really working yet. And then about five to six years ago, we started to get human level performance on those kinds of advanced perception tasks using deep learning algorithms. And now, rather than having all of the different researchers in machine learning work on making machine learning work, we've branched out into many different areas. I think of it as a little bit like the Cambrian explosion, when we saw many different body types of animals appear at the same moment in evolutionary history. So I'll go through each of the different modern research areas where I think that adversarial machine learning is relevant and show you some of the things that adversarial machine learning is contributing to the research frontiers today. One area where adversarial machine learning is very relevant to the modern research frontier is the idea of generative modeling. A generative model is a model that trains on a collection of data, such as the images of celebrity faces on the left side of this slide, and learns to create new, new data coming from the same distribution. The images of celebrities on the right side of this slide were actually created by a generative model. They are not only photos that have never existed, they're actually individual people who have never existed. But somehow or other, they have some of the same qualities as the celebrities shown in the training data. The generative model accomplishes this by inferring the probability distribution 
that represents the training data and then generating more samples from that probability distribution. The main way that adversarial machine learning is relevant to the generative modeling problem is through the generative adversarial networks framework that I developed with my collaborators at University of Montreal in 2014. The basic idea behind this framework is we make a contrived game between two different players. I say it's contrived because we actually control both players and we want them to compete. You'll see later there are a lot of situations in adversarial machine learning where we don't get to opt in. There really is someone attacking a service we're trying to build. But here for the generative adversarial networks framework, we create an imaginary conflict in order to force both players to get better. One of the players is a network called the discriminator that we represent with a capital letter D. The idea of the discriminator is that it's a, a deep neural network that acts as a classifier. It looks at the input and it guesses whether the input is real or fake. So for example, we might load this real photo of a moth shown on the left side of the slide and run it through the discriminator network. The discriminator network will then try to output a number near one, indicating that the probability of the input being real rather than fake is high. We start to see that this is a game when we bring in the other player, the generator. The generator takes random noise and transforms it to produce outputs that resemble the training data. Early in training, the generator will not actually produce realistic images. I've illustrated this by showing the image of the animal that is kind of like a cow that is both quadrupedal and bipedal at the same time. This is a defective sample that came from a generator network. And over the course of learning, we will train the discriminator to reject these kinds of images. The way it works is we begin by sampling a noise vector that we call Z. You can think of noise as being a little bit like the seed for a pseudo random number generator. It's a source of randomness that allows an otherwise deterministic system to have many different behaviors. We then take that, that noise vector Z and we transform it until we get something in the same format as the training data using a neural network called the generator represented by capital letter G. After we've obtained this image, we then feed it onward to the discriminator. Previously, we gave the discriminator a real image and the discriminator tried to output a value near one. Now the discriminator tries to output a value near zero. However, we also train the generator to try to fool the discriminator, to try to make the discriminator output a value near one. It turns out that you can analyze this through the language of game theory. And we can think of there being a Nash equilibrium that indicates uh, exactly the situation where the generator has recovered the training distribution perfectly. At the Nash equilibrium, the best that the discriminator can do is guess randomly, and the generator is able to perfectly reproduce the training data. Over the past few years, there's been rapid progress in the development of generative adversarial networks for creating faces. In the original paper on generative adversarial networks, my co-authors and I were able to train models that could generate low resolution grayscale images of faces. But afterward, faster GPUs and better generative adversarial network algorithms have resulted in higher and higher quality faces to the point that modern generative adversarial networks are able to generate photorealistic images at resolutions of 1024 by 1024, as shown on the right end of this slide. But faces are actually relatively easy. Every photo is of a face that has been centered, and it's usually a face that's more or less aimed toward the camera. And there's really only one kind of object in each of these photos. It turned out that it was a lot harder to get generative models to create a wide diversity of different kinds of objects. We have also seen rapid create all 1,000 different objects in the ImageNet data set until about 2016 with the introduction of Augustus Odina's class conditional auxiliary class scan. The basic idea behind this model is that the generator is told to generate a specific image from a specific class. After this basic framework began to work successfully, it has rapidly improved. Uh, Takiro Miyato at uh, Preferred Networks created a model that could generate much more realistic images by using a special normalization approach to make the learning process smoother. And uh, this year, my team at Google on a project uh, done primarily by intern Han Zhang created a model that uses attention to create highly realistic images on the ImageNet data set. Uh, GANs are useful for many different uh, application areas. One of them is uh, creating artificial training data. Uh, the first machine learning research paper from Apple 
which went on to win a Best Paper Award, I believe at CVPR, was based on this idea of melding two different sources of data using a generative model. The basic idea is that Apple would like to train a model that can tell what direction a user's eyes are pointed so that a user can click on icons on an iPhone or an iPad just by looking at them. The challenge is that it's hard to collect labeled images of users' eyes with labels indicating where the eye is actually looking. Uh, users don't generally want to sit in an eye tracking machine for hours and hours and hours. So Apple has a lot of unlabeled photos of real eyes, and these are highly realistic. Apple was also able to make a 3D rendering engine that can draw 3D images of eyes pointed in directions of the, of the programmer's choice. But those synthetic images shown in the lower left are not very realistic. This is where generative models came in. A generative adversarial network was trained to take synthetic images and modify them to make them look realistic as judged by a discriminator network. The refined images then have the direction that was chosen by the programmer and originally rendered by the 3D engine, but they have realism comparable to the photos used in the training set. Uh, we can also see that generative adversarial networks are useful for unsupervised learning, where we are not really able to collect labeled data um, because of the, the logistical challenges of trying to get those labels. In this paper from NVIDIA by Ming-Yu Liu, we see that it's possible to train a generative adversarial network to convert night videos, or sorry, to convert day videos into night videos. If you think about how challenging it would be to collect the training data for this, you see that there would be a lot of logistical challenges that don't have any obvious way of being overcome. If you wanted to make a collection of training data with a pair of an image in the daytime and the same image at nighttime, repeated millions of times over, for every day image, you would need to record all of the cars that were on the road, where they were on the road, what direction they were traveling, and so on. And then get all those cars to come back to the same place and reenact exactly the same video sequence at night. That's the way that traditional supervised learning would need to have the data prepared in order to solve this problem. With generative adversarial networks, it's possible to do what's called unsupervised image-to-image -image translation. Instead of training on pairs of images from one domain and images from the other domain, uh, the model trains on a large collection of individual images taken at day and a large collection of individual images taken during the night. There's no need for the same image to appear in both of these sets of data, and there's no need for any of the images to be aligned into pairs of equivalent images across the two domains. Instead, the generative model learns to transform a day image and produce a night image. And then the discriminator evaluates whether that is a realistic night image. It doesn't need to have a specific target that it's trying to hit. One of my favorite examples of an unsupervised image to image model is CycleGAN. Here, CycleGAN is able to take a video of a horse and turn it into a zebra. I think it's a really compelling and fun video. And it also shows us a few of the issues that come up in terms of bias in machine learning data sets. Uh, because horses are mostly photographed in uh, green environments, like in Europe and North America, and zebras are mostly, uh, mostly photographed in arid environments, like in Africa, we see that the cycle GAN actually changes the color of the grass in the background to make it look like it's in a drier climate where the zebra would live. Um, it's interesting because the cycle GAN doesn't actually know what we want it to do. We tell it it should convert the horse photos into the zebra photos, but we don't ever have any interface to the model specifying that the horse itself is the part that we care about. And so it just does its best to convert all of the statistics of the data. Generative models can also be, designed, be used to design uh, new kinds of objects or genes or pieces of, of information in general. Uh, a company called Deep Genomics has shown some experiments in silico where they use generative adversarial networks to model uh, DNA sequences. And then they, they use this model to guide a search algorithm that looks for DNA sequences that are able to make proteins that bind very powerfully to a specific receptor. This suggests that generative models can be used to make uh, new medicines that would not have been feasible to design just based on uh, human designers' ability to look at DNA sequences and estimate what the best order of, of the different base pairs would be. The generative model is able to form 
the kind of intuition for DNA sequences that the human brain has for things like sounds and images. And this makes it a powerful tool for designers. Uh, I think that we're about to see a large wave of what I've called personalized ganufacturing. Um, what I mean by personalized ganufacturing is using a GAN to create uh, highly specific objects for individual people. So far since the Industrial Revolution, we've seen that it's possible to produce very large amounts of products and distribute them to very large audiences, uh, making it possible for very many consumers to get, get uh, strong benefits at low cost. We seem to have lost Ian's audio. Um, I'm sure he'll be back in a minute if everyone can just uh, be patient. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, great. I just had to unplug and replug my mic. No um, which which slide did you last hear me on before my audio cut out? Personalized GAN. Um, Ganufacturing? Yeah. Okay, great. So I wasn't that far behind. Yep. Yeah. Um, so the basic idea of personalized Ganufacturing is you can have generative models create highly customized uh, objects for each individual customer or patient. Uh, we've seen the first example of this from Glidewell Dentistry. They are able to make personalized dental crowns for each patient. Uh, the design of a dental crown is complicated because you need the shape of the crown to look like a real tooth, and you need it to actually function like a real tooth. It needs to interact with the patient's other teeth that are already in their mouth and successfully accomplish biting and chewing actions. So far, this has mostly been done by human designers. Specially trained technicians spend about two weeks to make each patient's dental crown. Uh, now, with generative adversarial networks, it's possible to design them basically instantly and then 3D print them uh, rather than needing a, a consuming amount of human time to create them. For the patient, this is beneficial not just because it will cost less, but also because you can get your crown right away. Uh, previously, with the need for a human technician to design the crown, there was usually a two-week waiting period where the patient would wear a temporary crown that didn't fit them very well, and then go back for a second procedure to install the finished final crown when it was ready. Uh, the state of the art for generating images with generative adversarial networks today is the self-attention GAN. Uh, this is the best model that we have for the ImageNet data set today. And the basic idea behind the self-attention GAN is that we would like to get highly realistic examples of all of the different image categories in the image data set, ImageNet data set. There are a thousand of these categories. And some of them have uh, relatively little structure, like the geyser shown in the upper right here. Generative models have been good at making these relatively unstructured images for quite a while. But what's harder for them is to make images that have a lot of structure, uh, like these birds that have thin vertical legs and a beak, and we need everything to actually fit together in a coherent pattern to make a bird shape. Um, until recently, this is very hard for generative models. And now, using uh, the self-attention layers from a paper called Non-Local Networks in the context of generative adversarial networks, we're able to solve these really hard coordination tasks. So for example, uh, all of these images here are generated by, uh, by, the, by the generator network. And we can actually peek inside and see what the attention was doing while it drew this 
each of these images. So here, if we look at this red key point on the dog's eye, we can actually look at the attention map and see where the attention was directed elsewhere in the internal representation of the image as it was generating the eye. So you can see that it primarily attended the dog's face, especially the dog's other eye. And we believe that that helps it to draw a dog with a symmetrical face uh, with both kinds of, with both eyes matching in terms of size and color and shape. In the past with purely convolutional models, it was difficult to coordinate the generation of features that were separated from each other like that. Um, another common failure mode of generative models is that they fail to draw the legs on animals. Here we can look at the attention mechanism for the self-attention GAN, and we can see that it actually looks up and down the leg that it's drawing at any one point of the leg to make sure that that leg actually successfully extends downward and separates from the body. And also it, it glances at the other leg to make sure that it's drawing the right amount of legs. It's hard to know for sure that this is exactly what it's doing, but mistakes like drawing too many legs or not extending the legs down far enough went away when we introduced these attention mechanisms. And the shape of the attention maps is consistent with what we would expect for the attention working to reduce those problems. One thing that's really nice about the attention mechanism from the non-local neural networks paper is that it lets us work with attention neighborhoods that have very irregular shapes. In the past, you've seen a lot of papers about attention where you could draw little circles or ovals or, or rectangles of attention mass. Uh, here, we're actually able to draw very flexibly shaped attention areas. Like for example, when drawing the bird, of uh, drawing the tail of this bird, the attention mask goes uh, right along the tail feathers of the bird. And I just wanted to check, can everyone still hear me okay? Perfect. Okay, great. Um, all right, so that covers generative modeling. Uh, another area where adversarial machine learning is very important is security. Um, the use of machine learning actually opens up new attack surfaces that security researchers should consider. In fact, this was actually just uh, the front page of the ACM magazine uh, uh, this July. The basic idea behind the security issues with machine learning is that in the past, we saw attack surfaces like application level security, where attackers could fool a computer into actually executing the wrong instructions on its CPU. Uh, or we saw things like network level security, where people could lie about who they are in the network and in intercept messages that weren't intended for them or send messages that appear to be from another user. Machine learning now opens a new attack surface where even if your CPU is actually running all of the correct instructions, and even if you know the identity of everyone on a network, a machine learning algorithm might just plain be fooled into taking the wrong action. It looks a little bit more like a gullible person uh, rather than some of the previous ways that we've seen computer security come up where, where things like buffer overrun attacks uh, more directly control what the computer does. Here, the computer is still in some sense in control and operating the way it's meant to, but it's making very bad decisions and the attacker is able to influence those decisions. One of the main security concerns that I've studied is a topic that I named adversarial examples. The basic idea is that at test time, a machine learning algorithm is using parameters that have already been learned by studying a training set that didn't contain any malicious data. Uh, but an attacker is able to modify the input that the model receives at test time. And this modification to the test time input is sufficient to cause uh, bad outputs where the attacker chooses the output rather than the defender. It turns out it's actually very easy to fool machine learning models in this way. Uh, here I show an image of a panda and we add a very small perturbation to this image. I've actually scaled it down small enough that it isn't represented in the 8-bit image that we actually put in the presentation. So you can't actually see the difference between this image and this image. The neural net can see the difference though, because the neural net receives the input using 32 bits of precision. It turns out that this, uh, this modification, which isn't even enough to see on the screen, is sufficient to change the neural net's classification from about 70% probability of this being a panda to 99% probability of this being a gibbon. Um, there's many other kinds of attacks that attackers can do at test time. They don't need to be little tiny modifications like that. 
Uh, we've seen things like graffiti on stop signs that makes them no longer recognized as stop signs, or even just uh, creating really weird images out of their normal context. Like just putting an apple in a bag of fruit or in a bag intended to carry fruit is enough to fool a lot of computer vision algorithms that were mostly trained on apples that were outside of the bag, even though this is a relatively normal context for an apple to appear in. Um, so this general challenge of making sure that the model processes test time inputs correctly and that the attacker cannot exploit systematic mistakes in the model is very difficult. We've even seen that attackers can fool the model if they don't have direct digital access to the model. You could imagine that some of these changes we're making are so small and subtle that they wouldn't survive things uh, like being viewed at a distance, being viewed through a camera lens, uh, being compressed with a JPEG compression algorithm in the digital world. Uh, here, my colleague Alex Karakin and I just printed out photos of adversarial examples and took pictures of them on an Android phone and classified them with an inception network on the Android phone. And we were able to cause them to be misclassified even just by printing the adversarial examples out. We didn't actually make any special effort to cause these adversarial examples to transfer through the physical world better uh, than, than a baseline that had no uh, design to operate in the physical world. Since then, other researchers have found even more reliable attacks by explicitly modeling some of the effects that happen when the attack is deployed in the real world. Uh, one of the best defenses against adversarial examples so far is the idea of adversarial training. At the start of this talk, I showed you how uh, adversarial machine learning is where we have essentially a game theoretic problem with more than one player, more than one cost. And we're looking for a Nash equilibrium of a game uh, rather than looking for a minimum of a cost function. We see this situation come up very explicitly in the context of adversarial examples. Uh, the learning algorithm is trying to estimate parameters for the model that are able to classify adversarial examples correctly. And the attacker is trying to choose examples from some allowed set of attack vectors that will cause the model to make a mistake as much as possible. Since about 2014, we've seen that uh, training on regular examples only uh, doesn't really do much for accuracy on adversarial examples. But training on uh, adversarial examples can actually increase the accuracy of a model in adversarial examples. So far, this method doesn't really work super well yet, but it's the best defense that anyone has tried. Uh, different versions of this defense are able to more or less solve some small tasks like MNIST, but we don't really have a strong solution to a large-scale difficult task like ImageNet yet. It's also important to emphasize that all of the defenses so far are based on unrealistically easy threat models where the attacker is very limited and can only do things like changing each pixel by a small amount. In most real world applications, the attacker would not be nearly so limited. But as a research problem, it's been really hard to solve even the limited version. And this remains a very active research area with a lot of important challenges to solve. Um, Another really popular research area today is reinforcement learning. Uh, reinforcement learning does not entirely work yet, and we are interested both in using the adversarial perspective to make sure that when reinforcement learning does work and is widely deployed, it'll be secure. We've studied things like making adversarial examples that cause reinforcement learning agents fail to play Atari games such as Sequest. Um, but you can also think of some of the strategies people use in reinforcement learning as examples of adversarial machine learning. In fact, you could say that reinforcement learning is the birthplace of adversarial machine learning. One of the first machine learning programs ever was Arthur Samuel's checkers playing agent that he wrote in 1959. Arthur Samuel himself was not an excellent checkers player. And at the time, people believed that computer programs could only do what their, their programmers instructed them to do. This implied that Arthur Samuel should not be able to create a strong checkers player. He disproved this general belief by creating a checkers playing agent that played games against itself and went on to become a better checkers player than he was. Today, we see this in things like AlphaGo, including AlphaGo Zero, and various projects from OpenAI, such as uh, sumo playing agents that learn via self-play, and the defense of the ancients player that learns from self-play. You can think of this as an adversarial game, uh, pitting each agent against a copy of itself. 
And we see that learning in these games greatly enhances their capabilities. Uh, the, the basic idea of extending self-play to other domains like generative models is the main way that adversarial machine learning has had a strong impact in these other settings. Uh, we've also seen that um, uh, reinforcement learning can be guided using techniques that came out of other domains of adversarial machine learning. For example, the discriminator from generative adversarial networks can be used as a reward function for reinforcement learning algorithms. Uh, here, Yaroslav Ganin and his collaborators at DeepMind uh, actually trained a robot to paint, to reproduce images, that it, it receives a digital input containing the image to be drawn, and then it actually paints on a real physical canvas and draws the same image. It's not able to compute a very good pixel-wise loss because with the paintbrush, it's never going to get exactly the same kind of pixel values as it gets in the input image. Any photo of the canvas is always going to uh, have shadows and lighting effects on the canvas itself, and the paint is shiny in places. So the pixel-wise loss uh, between the desired graphic and the actual photographic output is always going to be high. Uh, but a discriminator network coming from the generative adversarial network setting is able to get a good estimate of what the actual meaning of the image is and guide the reinforcement learning algorithm toward producing a successful final image through the painting process. Um, one of the other topics where adversarial machine learning is very useful is the idea of extreme reliability. To some extent, this is a little bit redundant with the idea of security. But in the sense of security, we're usually thinking of resilience to an attacker. There's also a lot of cases where there's not necessarily an attacker but we would still like to have the system be extremely resilient. So for example, autonomous vehicles, there may not be anybody attacking them just because you know, it's, it's easy enough to make people crash cars and, and generally there aren't a lot of attacks against human drivers trying to make humans crash cars. But we do want autonomous vehicles to be extremely robust. Um, we do want air traffic control systems to be extremely robust, even though all the air traffic controllers and all the pilots are are trying their best to cooperate. Um, a complicated system with important implications for safety requires that any use of machine learning in this cooperative setting be highly robust. Uh, things like surgery robots. There's presumably no adversary trying to interfere with the surgery, but we'd like the surgery robot uh, to successfully carry out the operation and not harm the patient. It turns out that a lot of the techniques from adversarial machine learning in terms of security can actually help with robustness in the natural setting. You can think of the minimax analysis in the security setting as studying how well the model will perform in the worst case. And if it's going to perform very well in the worst case, we know it will perform at least that well in the more natural statistically occurring case. We've also seen the development of some verification systems such as Reluplex that were originally developed in the context of verifying that systems are not vulnerable to adversarial examples. And then those have gone on to be applied to systems like air traffic control, even though air traffic control is usually not an adversarial setting. In general, what I would like to do with adversarial machine learning is make an engineering discipline out of machine learning in the same way that we saw distributed systems benefit from study of things like Byzantine fault tolerance. In the context of Byzantine fault tolerance, it was useful to bring in an imaginary adversary and prove that distributed systems would function well, even in the presence of an adversary, because that would mean that they would then function well in natural settings. And I think if we're able to develop those kinds of theoretical tools for machine learning, we'll make machine learning perform better across the board, even in settings that are not inherently adversarial. Um, another big research direction today is making machine learning more label efficient. Machine learning is very powerful, but it actually uh, requires quite a lot of training data in order to uh, successfully learn most concepts. And because of that, uh, there's a lot of a research effort to try to bring down the number of labels that are needed. We see this with generative adversarial networks, uh, where you can take a traditional discriminator that recognizes real and fake examples, and instead you can have it uh, recognize multiple classes of data. So say that you would like to train a classifier to recognize cats and dogs. Uh, you can make a discriminator for generative adversarial networks that recognizes real cats, real dogs, and also recognizes a category of fake images. 
if you then train a generative adversarial network to both generate data and have the discriminator recognize whether data is real or fake and what specific class it is, the resulting classifier is much more label efficient than a traditional classifier. Uh, my colleagues at OpenAI and I were able to show that we could learn to read handwritten digits with less than 1% error rate using only 100 labels. Just a few years earlier, it took about 60,000 labels to be able to do that. Uh, another approach to reducing the number of labels required involving uh, adversarial learning processes is virtual adversarial training invented by Takeru Miyato. Uh, in this benchmark here produced by uh, my collaborators at Google, we studied several different semi-supervised learning techniques, and we found that among the techniques we studied, virtual adversarial training was the best. You can see that on the x-axis, on the right side of the plot, where a lot of, of labels are available, all the different methods perform about the same, but only virtual adversarial training holds up well as we go to the extreme limit of very few labels. So what is virtual adversarial training exactly? In adversarial training, we train a classifier to be robust to adversarial perturbations. We make each of those adversarial perturbations by looking at the probability that the classifier assigns to the correct label and trying to reduce that probability. Uh, virtual adversarial training extends this process to also be able to learn from unlabeled data. Originally, we were not able to make adversarial examples for unlabeled data because we don't have the real label. The insight in the paper by Takeru Miyato is to use the model itself to provide a virtual label. In other words, when the model predicts the label, we just treat that as the true label for the purpose of creating adversarial examples. And then we train the model to classify the original clean unlabeled example the same as the corrupted adversarial example. Basically, you can think of this as a way of giving the model more constraints on its learning process. Usually we use labels to say, this one example should be labeled exactly the same as, as this training label. Uh, but we, we don't have more indirect constraints. Virtual adversarial training introduces a lot of indirect constraints, saying among these two unlabeled, adver uh, unlabeled examples, both should have the same label. We don't know what that label is, but the two examples should at least be labeled consistently. And this brings in enough extra information about the task that the model can perform much better. Uh, another topic that's important for adversarial machine learning is the topic of privacy. In this case, we don't necessarily define a minimax game, but we do have the concept of a defender and an attacker. Specifically, say that we have a lot of training data that only the, the defender has access to. And we use that training data to learn parameters that we then want to publish. Maybe we want to train a medical diagnosis system on sensitive private medical records. And then we want to open source our model so that doctors around the world can use it to diagnose their patients. Uh, if we then publish these parameters, they're available to attackers who can see public data. And these attackers might try to reverse engineer our training set and recover private medical information. Um, I just wanted to check and make sure the audio is still working OK. Working great. Great, thank you. All right, so one of the best situations in adversarial machine learning is actually the privacy of training data problem. This is one of the very few cases where we actually have provable guarantees and, and things are actually easier for the defender than for the attacker. Um, the provable defenses that we have are based on a framework called differential privacy. Uh, if you're like me and you've been working in deep learning for years and working with uh, calculus quite a lot for training deep models, you probably hear the word differential and immediately think of derivatives. But here, differential is actually referring to the difference between two different data sets. If we imagine that there's one data set containing a specific person's records and another data set lacking that person's records, differential privacy says it would be great if we could train our algorithm on these two different data sets and end up with uh, parameters that are statistically indistinguishable uh, so that no attacker can tell which of the two training sets the parameters came from. Being able to do this requires introducing some stochasticity into our training algorithm so that there's uncertainty about which parameters come from which data set. And if we can show that the stochasticity has a greater effect uh, than the inclusion or exclusion of an individual patient, and the attacker can't figure out whether that, that user was even in the training set or not, 
then in some sense we can say that we have not violated that patient's privacy because they didn't substantially affect the final parameters. Uh, one of the techniques that we developed at Google is called private aggregation of teacher ensembles. The basic idea is to partition the data into different subsets and train a different teacher network uh, to model each of these subsets of the training data. Because no individual example appears in more than one of these subsets, each teacher network is learning completely independently how to solve the problem. We then have the teachers vote about how to process new public data, and we use noisy votes to determine the final output for each input example. If two teachers agree on how to process an input example, it must be because of a general pattern and not because of a quirk of one user's data. Because neither no, the two teachers voting did not ever uh, both see the same user's data. The main reason we need to add noise in the aggregation mechanism is that there's still one way we could leak, uh, leak uh, private information. Suppose that the teachers don't actually agree. If we then refuse to publish any classification for the input data, an attacker could learn something about the, the fact that the two teachers did not agree. What we do instead is we have lots of teachers and we throw in noisy votes as well. This way we can always publish uh, a prediction, but sometimes that prediction will be wrong if not enough teachers agree on the right answer. Using the noise and using the framework of differential privacy, we're able to prove that this is actually a secure mechanism for publishing classifications. And, and we can actually provide explicit quantitative bounds on how much privacy is being lost. Um, another topic where adversarial machine learning can be very useful is the idea of domain adaptation. Domain adaptation is where we train on one kind of data and then deploy the model on a slightly different kind of data. For example, we might train on relatively high quality labeled photos, like in the ImageNet, ImageNet data set, but then deploy on relatively low quality photos taken by users in real environments on their cell phones. One solution to this is the domain adversarial networks framework. The basic idea is to establish a two player game where one player extracts features from the image that are intended to be good for classifying the image accurately. And another player attempts to look at the features and guess which of the two domains the input belong to. The feature extractor network tries to learn features that are not just good for classification, but also fool the domain predictor network so that it ends up learning features that are independent of the domain and the feature quality doesn't uh, degrade when we move to the final domain. This doesn't necessarily work in every domain. Um, I, I, I heard a story from Alyosha Efros at Berkeley that he tried to see if this would work if you used the domain of training images and test images. And unfortunately, it did not cause uh, performance on the test images to get better. It caused performance on the training images to get worse. But there is actually one way that you can use uh, domain adversarial learning to perform well at test time. It's called professor forcing. The basic idea is that recurrent neural networks used to generate text are usually trained with a technique called teacher forcing. The training data contains sentences of text uh, presented one word at a time. And the recurrent net is trained to load one word at a time of the training set text and maximize the probability of the next word in the sequence. But at training time, the RNN's predictions are never used as input to the RNN itself. If you read the word um, adversarial learning and the RNN thought you were going to say adversarial machine learning, uh, the word machine that isn't in the training data never actually gets fed back into the RNN. This means that the RNN does a good job of maximizing the likelihood of the training set, but when you deploy it to generate samples, it might have to generate samples that are very different from anything it saw during the training time. And in longer and longer sequences, it veers further and further from the training data set and starts to produce worse and worse quality of samples. The idea behind professor forcing is to replace teacher forcing with a domain adversarial learning process. The two domains are the domain of running the RNN clamped to the training data and running the RNN in free sampling mode. The hidden units of the RNN are then trained to be statistically indistinguishable between these two domains in order to pr improve the sample quality of the final model. We can also see that generative adversarial networks can help with domain adaptation by simulating the final domain. For example, GraspGAN developed at Google Brain uh, trains in simulation 
to learn to grasp, uh, for a robot to grasp many different objects. But in the original simulator, there is not very much interesting background behind these objects. In the real world, the background is full of distracting clutter that appears both in the camera and in the depth mask used to guide the arm. Um, GraspGAN is based on training with generative adversarial networks that produce realistic clutter in order to simulate the final deployment domain better during the simulation stage. Um, another topic that comes up a lot in, in adversarial machine learning is fairness. Uh, when we make machine learning algorithms that make important decisions affecting people's lives, we would like them to ignore certain attributes of people that are not relevant to those decisions and that are commonly discriminated against, such as gender or race. It's not sufficient to just take a machine learning model and train it with no access to the race variable or no access to the gender variable, because your training data may have been created by people who had biases themselves, and the model may learn to repeat their behavior without observing the race variable or the gender variable. Um, if they find that some other characteristic is correlated with the race variable or the gender variable, the model can make biased decisions using that intermediary variable. So one idea in adversarial machine learning is to create an adversarial process for learning the features, where um, one player pulls out the features and another player tries to guess the value of variables that we don't want to participate in the decision. Uh, over time, this forces the feature extractor to learn a representation that has hidden all of the information about the sensitive variable, uh, thus helping to make decisions that are not biased by that particular information. Another area where I think that adversarial machine learning can be very useful is accountability and transparency. To really understand what our machine learning algorithms are doing, we'd like to have interpretability tools. Unfortunately, interpretability is still in its infancy. And I think that adversarial machine learning can show uh, some of the ways that the interpretability tools can be improved. A lot of the time we see that people working in the interpretability literature and the adversarial machine learning, le adversarial machine learning literature are asking more or less the same questions, such as, how does this model work? We find that people who build interpretability tools often produce images like the ones shown on the right, where we say that a cat is classified as a, cla as a cat because of the cat pixels, and a dog is classified as a dog because of the dog pixels. Uh, this is a very nice result, and it seems very reassuring. But unfortunately, people working in adversarial machine learning for security purposes who do security audits often find, such as the image of the panda on the upper right, that machine learning algorithms work for very mysterious and, well, relatively broken ways, that they tend to get a lot, a lot of wrong results in ways that the current interpretability tools would not predict. I think these two research communities should work together more in order to produce uh, more effective interpretability tools that can discover when machine learning algorithms are working in incorrect and counterintuitive ways. I also think that as adversarial machine learning improves and we make our models more robust, they'll be easier to interpret. Right now, they make a lot of mistakes and use a lot of messy decision rules. But in the future, as they become more robust, they might start to make uh, better predictions. Here on the left, I show what happens if we load an image of a nine into a model that is not very adversarially robust, and we start to adversarially perturb it to turn it into the different classes. As we read through the image left to right, top to bottom, um, everywhere that you see a yellow box, it's been turned into a different digit class. So at the end of the first row, there's a yellow box around the nine. That's actually classified as a zero with high confidence. And then the second row, there's another yellow box. Uh, there it is classified as a one. And then the next yellow boxes are a two, a three, a four, and so on. The only one that's actually correct is the nine in the lower right. And the only reason that that actually looks like a nine is that we started the whole process with a nine. So when we have a relatively vulnerable model, in this case, it's just a shallow linear softmax classifier, it's actually very hard to interpret what the model does because it makes so many counterintuitive mistakes. And it would be hard for an interpretability tool to explain to a human all these different ways that even a relatively simple linear model can go wrong. On the right, I show what happens when we take an adversarially robust model. It's not perfectly robust, but it's a lot better than the linear model. Uh, this one is also a shallow model based on RBF units. And on this relatively robust model, we see that as we optimize the input, we actually get recognizable examples of each of the different digit classes. This seems much more amenable to interpretability analysis. On the left, we need to summarize all of these bizarre and counterintuitive failures 
on the right, um, most of what the model does is actually relatively intuitive to a human observer. Uh, finally, I think that adversarial machine learning can tell us a lot about neuroscience. Uh, by studying adversarial examples, we have found images such as uh, this cat and dog pair. The image on the left is a photo of a cat. The image on the right has been modified with a very small perturbation to produce an image that looks strongly like a dog to a human observer, even though the change is relatively small. This might tell us something about the manifold of images. It might tell us something about the way that the human brain processes visual information. But I think we're really just at the very start of this process of looking at adversarial examples in the context of neuroscience. I think we can think of them as a little bit like bug reports. And by looking at a lot of bug reports for the human visual system, we'll be able to reverse engineer better exactly how it works. Uh, those are all of the topics where I think adversarial machine learning is relevant to research today. And I'm available now for some questions. Thanks, Ian. So let's get started with the questions. Thanks for the interesting talk. Um, let's move on the questions. The first question is that, um, um, do you hear me well? Uh, yeah, I hear you. Okay. How to get started uh, to learn more about GAN? Oh, um, yeah, if you want to learn more about generative adversarial networks, I think one good starting point is a tutorial that I wrote for NIPS 2016. If you do a Google search, it's called NIPS 2016 Tutorial on, on GANs, and um, it is available on archive.org. Uh, it's, it's actually the top paper of all time on archive sanity. Uh, and... That's a little bit outdated now, but it does cover the basic ideas and helps you get up to speed quickly. Another thing you could do is you could look at the website for the CVPR 2018 tutorial on GANs. That was just last month, so it's much more up to date. And I believe there are videos of all the talks available now. If the videos are not up yet, they will be soon. And that should be a good way of learning about GANs in an up-to-date way. Thank you. So the second question is, like, how do you assess uh, the quality of generated images and videos? That is actually a really hard question, and it is an active area of research in its own right. Um, right now, one of my favorite metrics is the kernel inception distance, uh, but, but that has some of its own problems. Um, there's a really good paper called A Note on the Evaluation of Generative Models that describes a lot of why generative models are so hard to evaluate. One thing I can summarize is that there's a, a big difference in the ways that you might use a generative model. Sometimes you care about assigning accurate probabilities to test data. Sometimes you care about making images that are very visually appealing. Sometimes you care about generating samples that are truly very representative of samples coming from a distribution. And all of those have different metrics. It's possible to maximize some of those metrics while doing very badly on other metrics. Um, really, the best advice is if you pick some kind of application where you want to use your generative model, you can evaluate performance of the end-to-end -end system performing that application. For example, if you use GANs for uh, semi-supervised classification, it's straightforward to evaluate them just in terms of accuracy on the test set. Um, thank you. So the third question is like, uh, how do you perform um, generative adversarial neural network on text? and other discrete data, discrete kind of data? Yeah, discrete data is really hard for GANs because they're trained using the backpropagation algorithm, and they backpropagate uh, from a loss at the output of the discriminator, backward through the discriminator, to the output of the generator, and then onward through the generator to its parameters. So that point in the middle where you backpropagate through the output of the generator, backpropagation won't give you any useful information there if uh, the output of the generator is a step function, like with discrete data. There are workarounds, such as using reinforcement learning. But so far, we've mostly seen reinforcement learning work in places where the action set is relatively small. Like for Atari video games, there are just not that many keys that you can press during uh, gameplay of an Atari game. For things like generating text, uh, there are vocabularies of 
tens of thousands of words at every step in the sequence. And reinforcement learning algorithms don't scale very well to that domain. Uh, my co-authors and I published a paper called MaskGAN last year that makes some progress toward good text models with GANs. But overall, I would still say that discrete data is really hard for them. Um, thank you. And the next question is, like, how do you see the future of adversarial learning? And after that, like, uh, what is encouraging you to continue working on this domain? Yeah, so I would say um, some things that I hope for in the future for adversarial machine learning are... One, I think we will learn a lot about how to actually find Nash equilibria in complicated high dimensional games. The traditional game theory literature mostly covers things like low dimensional discrete games. And deep learning is now forcing us to confront very high dimensional continuous games. So I think we'll actually get some new basic math and we'll also open up all these new techniques for equilibrating games in machine learning settings. I also hope that we'll start to see a lot of things like uh, lower bounds on performance of machine learning algorithms where you can guarantee that they'll do at least as well as some uh, theoretical model. We've seen that a little bit with adversarial examples, but so far the guaranteed values are very low. And I'd like to see uh, machine learning become more of an engineering discipline where some of those guarantees are high. I also think we might start to see some impossibility results from adversarial machine learning. Uh, and, and I mean broadly scoped impossibility results. Right now, most of the impossibility results we have are relatively task specific, where we say that in specific settings, the attacker is always going to win, or at least the attacker can always degrade the defender's performance. Uh, but each of those proofs is for a relatively specific setting, and we don't yet have a good view of what's fundamentally possible in general. Um, thank you. And someone else also asked um, the applications in business and business and real world problems. You have oh, any comment on that? Yeah. So I think probably the most practical application for business today is improved performance on semi-supervised learning. Uh, if you have relatively little data, or if the world is very noisy and constantly changing, so that it's hard to get very much up-to-date data with the latest changes, then things like virtual adversarial training can help you a lot. Um, we actually use that in products at Google, but I can't discuss a whole lot about exactly what we do with it. But it, but it is an actual practical deployable technique. Uh, I also think a lot of adversarial machine learning is a research area and not, not totally suitable for deployment yet. I think things like generative models are close to being used for things like special effects. And we have seen, I guess, the first manufactured product coming out of a generative model. But I think very soon we'll see more uh, manufacturing driven by generative models. Also, right now, there aren't many attackers going after the machine learning attack surface because machine learning is still so new. Uh, but soon, I think there will be more attacks on machine learning. And the security angle of adversarial machine learning will be very important. Thank you, Ian. I'm afraid that we, um, we have run out of time today. I'd like to thank Ian again for his informative represent, um, presentation and insightful answers to the many questions. Special thanks to each of you for taking the time to attend and participate today. This webinar was recorded and will be available online in a few days at webinar.acm.org. You can find announcements on up upcoming webinars and other ACM activities on learning.acm.org and acm.org. Also, please fill, uh, fill out our quick survey uh, where you can suggest future topics or speakers, uh, which you should see on your screen. On behalf of the ACM, Ian Goodfellow and myself, Negor Rastamzade, thanks again for joining us, and I hope you will join us again in the future. This concludes the webinar. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>